Good morning. Good morning. Yay. Thank you for coming to Siegel 2014, our second year. Uh, Uh, attendees, sponsors, speakers, you're the reason Siegel exists, and we owe it all to you. If you didn't show up, it wouldn't happen. Uh, so yeah, make sure you stop by the Expo Hall, shake hands with all the sponsors. They, they pay the money, and we love them. We love you just as much, and uh, all the volunteers that make this thing happen, uh, I'm one of them, but there's dozens, uh, and we want your feedback. We want you to volunteer. We'd love your help. So if you could come on to the mailing list, it's just the Siegel organized. All the info is on our website, siegel.org. Check it out. Uh, or you just email staff at siegel.org if you have something you just you don't want to air publicly. Let us know anyway. We'd love to hear from you. Or just poke us, and we'll, we'll put it on the list for next year. Uh, this is Karen Sandler. She flew all the way over here. She's the executive director of the Software Freedom Conservancy. And we're so happy to hear, I'm not going to belabor her bio because it's in the program and she'll tell you a little bit more about herself. And thank you so much. Here's Karen. So for starters, let's, let's give a huge round of applause to the volunteers and organizers of this conference. It is not an easy thing to organize a conference, so uh, if you came and you uh, enjoyed the conference, definitely think about volunteering for next year because that's how these conferences get bigger and better and, uh, and it makes a huge difference. Um, so how many people for whom this is their first free, free and open source software event? Can you raise your hand? Okay, let's applaud these people too. Yay! <laughs> Thanks for coming, and I hope this is not your last. <laughs> I hope we, we have a great time together. <laughs> so, um, so just a little bit more about me. Um, I'm the executive director of the Software Freedom Conservancy. Um, until about six months ago, I was the executive director of the GNOME Foundation. How many people here are using GNOME? Yes! I applaud you guys. <laughs> Um, I'm also, so I'm no longer executive director, but I happily was elected to the board, so I still have a GNOME Foundation affiliation. Um, I am, and this is the part where I often hide behind the podium, but uh, I am a lawyer. So, you know. um, and, uh, but, but I only do pro bono work now, so, uh, so and for, for a while I've been a free and open source software lawyer. I was the general counsel of the Software Freedom Law Center, and uh, you know, now I, I, I give pro bono legal advice to questioncopyright.org and a lot of free software uh, organizations, um, too. Um, and I am, of course, a free software enthusiast, and you'll hear more about that, but I'm also a patient. Except Libra offices. Let's see. This is actually the very first time that I have ever had any problem presenting, um, and let alone have Libra office crash. Is Robinson here? <laughs> no, I saw him on the way in. I know he was at the booth, but you can you can talk to him about. It. <laughs> so actually, I I have a really big heart. <laughs> um, my heart is uh, is actually three times the size of a normal person's heart. Okay, that's a little bit of an exaggeration. It's like my heart is thick. So the the walls are very thick. And the problem with that is that it's like my heart is stiffer. It's a genetic condition, and. Um, I'm asymptomatic, so it's really not a problem. Um, everything is, um, is pretty normal, except that I'm at a very high risk of suddenly dying. Like, the doctors actually call it sudden death, um, and that's like the medical term. And the chances that I have, the probability of sudden death for me is two to three percent per year compounding. And I was diagnosed at age 31. So it was, it was, it was pretty upsetting and, um, and, you know, and it was weird because it was kind of an accident I found out about it. I didn't actually know I had, um, had a heart condition. I didn't go to the doctor because I wasn't feeling well from a heart perspective. So I, it, and so all of a sudden, I went from feeling like I was, you know, immortal <laughs> in, like the young and, in the normal ways that we are when we're, you know, uh, when we're 31. <laughs> and, uh, and instead, I, I, I heard that I, I, I could die suddenly if I didn't do something about it. And um, so, but the doctors say it's okay 
not to worry, you can get a pacemaker defibrillator. Um, and this is, this is a copy of, uh, of uh, uh, what it looks like. And when I was in the electrophysiologist's office, so um, electrophysiologists are a type of cardiologist that deal with the um, uh, electric stuff in the heart. And so I was, and, and, and I'm sitting like with this guy who he literally implants, you know, like he implants several of these a day sometimes, you know, like probably over a thousand per year. And he slides the pacemaker defibrillator because they, they keep them in their desk. Like the device manufacturers give them samples so that, you know, they can, they can have them and you give them to patients to hold so they're not so scary, right? There's this little thin device and he slides it across the desk and like very confidently, you know, like just pick it up. Like, hold it, see what you think about it, you know? Like, like, it's really not so scary, right? And so I pick it up and I'm looking at it and I say, what does it run? <laughs> and he looks at me like I have two heads. <laughs> and he was like, run? And I was like, yeah, you know, this has software on it. Um, you know, how else do you think it works? And he said, oh, you're right. I've never thought about this before. <laughs> you've never, you've implanted like over a thousand per year and you've never thought about the software in this device. Okay, fine, you know, like you don't know until you know. So, so I was like, no problem. But he said, okay, great. Well, there's a, a medical device, you know, a rep for a Medtronic who's, who's here today, who's in the, you know, who's actually in the office and I think he's here right now and he sticks his head out of his office and says, Tom, come on over. Right, so the medical device rep comes in and he says, you know, he sits down and he says, well, you know, Tom's gonna have all your answers. Ask, ask him. And so I said, you know, what, you know, what does it run? <laughs> and he said, and, and Tom said, run? <laughs> and the medical device rep had never thought about the issue. In fact, in his entire time of selling these devices, no one had ever asked him about the software. It was amazing. So um, I, I, I thought about all this and I explained sort of, you know, why the issues about software were important and why you needed to think about it if you were getting a pacemaker defibrillator or any other medical device. And I explained, <laughs> so for those of you who might not know this, this is Bill Gates as a Borg. <laughs> um, um, and so for those of you, you know, so I started to explain about how the software was probably proprietary software and how that was problematic. And I started to really wrestle with the idea of whether or not I was comfortable having proprietary software in my medical device. Because when I started to think about it, I realized that I was literally going to have proprietary software sewn into my body and screwed into my heart. And it was just this really powerful moment. I had been, um, I was already a lawyer at the Software Freedom Law Center, but I had originally gotten there because I thought open source was cool. You know, I really didn't, I was sick of being a law firm lawyer and I was looking for something else to do. And I had worked with a lot of, you know, at the Software Freedom Law Center, I was really lucky that my clients were passionate free and open source software people, um, many, some of whom are in the audience here now. And, you know, it was, I, so I started to really get a sense of the ideology in free software, but I, it hadn't, it didn't hit home until I was sitting there in that doctor's office. And so um, I had, I, 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 what did I do? Naturally, I procrastinated. <laughs> I, I didn't get the device for a while and it took going to brunch with a friend and you know, like maybe six months later and she said, are you, you know, when are you getting the defibrillator? And I said, ah, oh, well, you know, eventually. I'm kind of freaked out by the whole proprietary software thing. I don't know. I'm just, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking about it. And she started crying and she said, you know, I, I, when you don't have this, you know, when I don't speak to you, I, I worry that if you don't pick up the phone that you have died. And you know, knowing that it's such a high risk, you know, it's just upsetting to me as your friend. And that was sort of a moment for me and my, my parents were very upset um, and my then boyfriend. And you know, so basically I decided to get the defibrillator. So <laughs> I became a cyborg lawyer. <laughs> um, that means that I can shoot firebolts from my fingers. So <laughs> you guys have to be really nice to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but more seriously, I, I decided I would get the defibrillator because I needed it, but I would undertake a study so I could really understand the implications of software on medical devices. And because I was fortunate enough to be a lawyer at SFLC, I actually was able to launch a, um, you know, a, like an initiative within the Software Freedom Law Center. So it became part of my job to research it. And the things I discovered will not surprise many of you which is that um, 
that, oh, actually these slides are flipped, but um, that, uh, that, uh, that software has bugs. Like, you know, the Software Engineering Institute estimates that for every one defect, uh, uh, there, the, the, for every 100 lines of code, there is uh, one defect introduced, which is uh, kind of crazy. Um, that, you know, many bugs are caught, of course, but thinking about uh, overall, it's, it's pretty amazing. There was a study done where they evaluated the, um, where they evaluated recalls from the FDA, um, you know, basically devices that had been recalled that were connected to software. And of the recalls that they could evaluate, 98% uh, of them uh, would, have been, uh, would have been detected or prevented if they had employed all pairs testing, so testing for multiple parameters, basic computer science stuff. Um, and I also found out, and this is the thing that I would say shocking were it, not, were it not a terrible pun, but I actually just said it, so now you have to laugh. Um, but uh, but so, uh, so the FDA, so that like my, my electrophysiologist said, when I started to explain the issues, he said, well, you know, I, I, I hear what you're saying, and I understand that software is critical, but these devices are approved by the FDA. Like, you don't have to worry, because there's a agency that is, you know, is checking these devices for you. And you're basically being a little conspiracy theorist by thinking that someone would, why would anyone want to hack your pacemaker? Why would any, how could this, you know, this, you're just worried about nothing. So when I studied the FDA, I found that actually the FDA doesn't review the source code on these devices. In fact, because they generally don't do that, very occasionally they do if they think there's some real problem or have some reason to do, but it's really an exception. Um, but because they don't review the software, they don't even ask for it. So there's no public repository at the FDA. So for example, Medtronic is my manufacturer. Um, if there's catastrophic failure at Medtronic, you know, I'm out of luck. These devices are only as good as their batteries are. And we rely on um, you know, the fact that they're, so basically when you have these devices, they broadcast um, remotely and there are different ways to talk to them. Most uh, defibrillators are, are generally just uh, wirelessly broadcasting. So for example, uh, my father also has a pacemaker defibrillator now, proving the proposition that cyborg parents have cyborg children. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but not necessarily in that order since I got my, uh, my device first. <laughs> um, but, uh, but so his is broadcasting wirelessly such that when he gets into, like when he walks into the doctor's office, they change his pulse before he even sits down in the chair. Right, I mean, so um, raise your hand if you have an implanted medical device. If, if you want to, don't like, okay, so, um, so uh, I, I guess I was at a conference uh, uh, yesterday or two days ago where I met like four people with uh, implanted devices and I was like, cyborg party! Yes, uh, but, uh, but, but so, so for me, I was concerned, so my electrophysiologist um, had this great idea where, uh, where he called around all of the hospitals um, that were local in New York City and asked them if they had an old device. So I was able to get an older device that has no wireless component, and you talk to it with magnetic coupling, because I was really concerned about the safety of these devices. But anyway, the devices are only as, as good as their battery is. And so um, when, I, um, when my battery runs out, you basically have to get surgery to replace them. And, uh, and, it's, um, you know, and, and, and that's a, a big deal. So you need to be able to update the software on them and to, uh, and to correct. I've, I've, I've been incorrectly shocked three times by my device, um, which has been a cal calibration issues, right? So if I couldn't talk remotely to my device, it would be problematic. Um, so it's, it's lucky that we can, but, um, but it's really scary because in the instance that if you can't do an update, for example, if there's catastrophic failure at the medical device manufacturer, we're all just kind of out of luck and have to get new devices. Um, so there's no repository of the source code, which was crazy to me. And we're still, there is no clear set of requirements. Like there's no, um, no requirements as to what is, you know, what is, what should, you know, what is needed for review of the software. There's, um, there's recommendations. They basically leave it up to the companies themselves, the manufacturers themselves, to, um, to write reports about whether the software, you know, they, do, they do tests and they report on the, the software itself, and then the, the FDA reviews that and decides whether or not they think that's adequate. Uh, but they never look at the source code. And of course, 
I, when I was told that I needed this defibrillator, I asked for the source code and of course was told no. I called um, all three of the major medical device manufacturers and I said, please, I'm going to have to get this device um, you know, let me see the source code that's going to be in my body. And the device manufacturers basically never called me back. I went like up phone trees and left messages. And of course the answer was no. And I kept saying, I will sign an, you know, an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, which I really didn't want to do. But, you know, and I, I try to avoid signing confidentiality agreements generally. But, you know, in order to see this code, I was willing to do that. And of course I got nowhere. Um, at the same time, while the, the, uh, the medical device manufacturers were not taking me very seriously about this, and my doctors, you know, I, I said my, I talked about my electrophysiologist, but I actually went through a few electrophysiologists. <laughs> the, the first electro, electrophysiologist who I asked, you know, who showed me the device, uh, he basically, when I, um, so uh, he, he basically didn't believe me that this was an important issue. Um, and I called him when, um, these devices were shown that they could be hacked. You know, they were by 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 academics. They were it was demonstrated that they could be taken control of. And this is a guy, um, Barnaby Jack. How many people have heard of him? Okay, so like like a quarter of the audience. Um, he's a really cool guy. He heard me talk about my defibrillator, and he um, and and he was he basically decided to work on this issue. And so he was able to demonstrate. So, okay, so he's here um, in front of an, uh, uh, an ATM. And what's cool about that is that this is sort of what he got famous for. It's, uh, and this is, long, this is before I met him, but uh, it's uh, in this, this cash machine, he was known for, uh, for on an expo floor, taking control of it. And um, it's shooting out like dollar, uh, shooting out uh, money. And, and his, name, his last name was Jack. And so he, he said jackpot. Um, and so it flashed jackpot, and so they called it jackpotting because his, his last name was Jack. Um, but he, so he was, a, he among others, so there, he wasn't the only one, there were other researchers who were able to do it. But, uh, but he, uh, he was able to show that you could remotely with an, you know, with like an iPhone, um, find, like pick up the serial numbers of implanted medical devices. So um, if people were walking around, identify that there was an implanted medical device around and if it was an insulin pump deliver a uh, you know a, a, a lethal dosage and if it was a pacemaker defibrillator a fatal shock so um, so when the first study came out showing that these devices were vulnerable I called that electrophysiologist and I was like it was in the New York Times and I was like okay the New York Times is echoing what I told you do you believe me now and he and he hung up on me <laughs> he said, he said, he said uh, if you know, he said something's wrong here. I think he, he knew I was a lawyer, I guess, and people, people don't trust lawyers, I wonder. <laughs> and so he said, well, you know, if, if you're, you know, if you decide you want to get the pacemaker defibrillator, I will help you, but something's not right here. And he hung up, and so I had to find a whole new electrophysiologist. It was very upsetting. Um, to say the least, and um, and at least you know through through the time the years as this as this progressed, at least the the hacks were clearer and clearer, and we could see that we couldn't ignore uh, what was happening, and um, and you know what what became clear in in my research, and I think is clear to all security experts, is that security through obscurity doesn't work, um, right? The, the academics were able to show, were able to take control of these devices. Barnaby Jack was able to show that he could um, kill people with an iPhone in a public place if they had an implanted uh, defibrillator, even though the source code um, was closed and not available for them to review. Um, and so the idea that by not publishing the source code that you would somehow be safer is, you know, is simply unfounded. You know, attackers, um, you know, attackers can find a way, but, uh, but if we don't have free and open source software, then those of us who are relying on the software can't review it, can't find out if it's, um, if it's safe. And, um, and this became totally clear, um, you know, in the, in the course of, uh, of, of my research and the course of talking to people. And, um, and once you start talking about medical devices, it's really not that far to go to cars. Um, and uh, this is this was a study that was done. There have been multiple ones now, um, but a, a premium class car has like a hundred million lines of code in it, which is a lot. And if you think back to that software uh, engineering institute estimate of one bug per one hundred lines of code, that's a lot of bugs. Even if they get most of them, that's still a lot of bugs. Um, so um, so this study was pretty cool. Um, 
And if you see in the picture, this is a, a picture of the dash of the car that was taking control of, and you'll see that, um, that the speed is at 140, but the car thinks it's parked. Or, or vice versa, you know, and on the, it says, uh, the, on the dash it says pwned by uh, car shark were the people who were, that's what they call their project. Um, and so, um, you know, and there have been uh, more than one brand of luxury car that you can control, that researchers found they could control um, remotely. And the, the, the vulnerabilities there were really um, extreme, as you can see here. Um, notices of things are very are, are like kind of the first thing that um, that people mess with if, mess with if they can like for example cars that are broadcasting um, wheel maintenance systems where they talk where they they're basically exporting their pressure systems you can easily spoof that so that the car thinks that the tire pressures are low and if you're on the highway it could potentially cause the car to stop um, or slow um, suddenly and there are all these really interesting um, uh, interesting hacks if you have time uh, there's a uh, this video on YouTube of, uh, of the Prius hack, which is really like kind of hilarious where they go through all the different kinds and there's, uh, there's a reporter who's at the wheel of the car and they're doing all of these things while he's driving, <laughs> you know, in very like small ways. And he's like, wait, the car's slowing, but my foot is on the gas, you know, and things like that. It's really uh, amazing. Um, and now where we have an internet of things, right, where like our, you know, our refrigerator is broadcasting and connecting to other things in our house, our security system. Um, you know, everything is talking to everything else. And we are only as safe as our weakest link, right? We're only as safe as our weakest link because with cars, for example, you know, no one is going straight for the brake system when they're, uh, when they're looking for exploits. They go through the wheel maintenance system, right? Entertainment systems, where things are talking to everything else. Um, you know, we're vulnerable. So all of our software is is connected to each other. So how do we identify which of our software is safety critical? You wouldn't think that your smartphone was a safety critical software, but if that's talking to your medical device, all of a sudden, do we want Apple in charge of our health? I mean, all this thing is, uh, is these things are, 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 are terrifying when you think about it. And do we really want our lives to rely on software we can't look at? Security through obscurity doesn't work. If we can't review the software um, generally, then how will we know, uh, you know, how will we know that the software that we rely on is something we can rely on? Free and open source software, um, as probably most of you know, um, is great because you can check these things for yourself. You can check the risks yourself, and you can, um, you can figure out what's going on. And if there is a problem, you don't have to wait for the company that made the software to admit that there's a problem, right? You can just fix it. Um, and so there have been a few famous uh, vulnerabilities in the last few months in free and open source software. But you'll notice that with them, once the vulnerabilities were, um, were discovered, they were announced, there were multiple patches and multiple fixes from all over the world. If you're relying on a proprietary software company, then you have to wait for that company to announce, to basically go through their PR department, <laughs> admit that there's a problem, and then fix it. And no one else can fix it. So there's delay and, um, and obfuscation, which is not safe for anybody. Um, and then you're not relying just on that one company. Anyone can do it. Um, and then free and open source software is really fun and collaborative. And so there are all these great reasons why you should um, use free and open source software um, and build on free and open source software. But free software is better uh, and safer over time. All of the studies show that while free software, um, free and open source software may not be better, right? Like just because software is free and open source doesn't mean that it's magically going to be, you know, have more features or be better or be safer. It's, uh, it's just because it's free and open that doesn't mean those things. But over time, popular, um, popular software becomes better and safer over time. And, um, and security experts pretty much agree that this is the case. And at the end of the day, the only way that software will be uh, safe and secure is if it's free and open. So all of the, you know, a lot of the, the security software is based on free and open source software, and that's for a reason. Um, there's this study that I, um, that I found out about recently, but it's from 2010, um, where they talk about this thing called the honeymoon effect. And I read about this, and it kind of blew my mind. So you know how, so, so there's a, basically, when you're working on a free and open source software project, or any software, the number of bugs over time decreases generally. There's a little uptick at the end, but, but, but studies show that, that as you would expect, 
the number of bugs decreases as the software is used, as more people um, you know, work on it, and as bugs are reported. Um, but this is a chart of, of vulnerabilities. And what you'll see is that there's actually, they call it the honeymoon effect because it's like a honeymoon period with the software. And basically that there's a period of time where there are no vulnerabilities and exploits that are, or, you know, that are discovered. And then once one is discovered, it becomes like exponential growth and there are more. And what that period of time is, you know, is really dependent on a lot of extrinsic factors. And so this is a quote from the, the study. And they found things that uh, free and open source software advocates have been talking about for a long time, which is that, uh, that in free and open source software, it takes longer for the attackers to find the bugs. And that also that, uh, that the learning curve doesn't um, accelerate as much uh, as it does in uh, closed source systems. But, but back to this graph, because when I saw this, it amazed me because when you have a problem, when there's going to be a vulnerability or an exploit, that's not gonna happen on day one. That's not gonna happen in week one, probably. It may not even happen in month one, right? It's gonna happen all the way down the road, right? It's gonna happen when you might not have a great relationship with your supplier anymore, right? If you're in a software company, if you're in a, a, a manufacturing company, like if you've bought software from someone else or if you've gotten it from someone else, you don't know when you're gonna need a fix. So you have to plan for the time where you don't have the person who originally wrote the code available to help you in the case that there's a vulnerability and an exploit. And what that tells me is that we need to insist that businesses actually start to wake up to this and see that they are going to need, and just to use from the, the uh, term from the GPL, complete and corresponding source code with scripts for installation. <laughs> because what happens down the road when we have a vulnerability and our companies don't have access to the source code and that company is out of business? We are totally screwed, right? We're totally screwed. And I think that businesses, for them to feel comfortable and safe with their software, at least for themselves, have to ask for complete and corresponding source code. How many people here work at software companies? Yeah, so maybe like half of the people here, maybe a little bit more. Um, you know, I, I think for me, this was the most compelling case for demanding source code from your vendors that I've ever seen before. And it really um, amazed me and, um, and, and surprised me too at the same time. Um, so, you know, what kind of world do we want to build? Software is, um, is a, a corner, is, is, is one issue, right? And free and open source software is a cornerstone of ethical technology. But we have, to, we have to start there and say, you know, what do we expect from businesses and what do we expect from the products that we purchase? Um, so I'm using my software, my cyborg powers for good. <laughs> um, I really wish I could shoot sparks. That would be really cool. If like someone fell asleep during my talk, I could be like, shh. Um, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm the executive director of the Software Freedom Conservancy. I went from my legal role to, um, to an, more of an advocate, and, an advocate role. And I, 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 when I went to GNOME, I basically went to one of my clients because I, I felt like I couldn't just be in a service side of free and open source software. I had to be helping to promote, uh, to promote it and to, to, to get its adoption. So these are, they're over, uh, how many people have heard of Conservancy? Yay. Like, actually three quarters of the people in this room, which is pretty exciting. Um, so Software Freedom Conservancy is an umbrella organization. It's a charitable nonprofit, and we have over 30 free and open source software projects in it, and some of which you've surely heard of. Um, and uh, I like to say, if you're using a computer, you're probably using uh, some of our software. Um, uh, so things like uh, uh, Git Samba, Wine, Inkscape, um, BusyBox is in lots of, uh, lots of things that you'll, you'll run into in the world. Um, and what is important about Conservancy is that it's software projects that are represented by a charitable nonprofit. It's projects that are, are interested in a neutral playing field, they're interested in transparency, and they're interested in ethics. It's software that respects user freedom, um, and it's software without surveillance. And what's amazing and valuable about free software is that we hear a lot of discussion about pivoting business models, so we use a lot of, how many people here have you Skype in the last three months? Yeah, like a very, a very high, actually 
like the same number as herd of as of herd of conservancy, which is <laughs> it's a much lower number here um, than in any other place I've ever asked that question. So actually, can you give yourselves an applause because um, like every other conference that I asked that to, pretty much every person except one or two people raised their hands. Um, so that's pretty amazing. But we're integrating software in our lives that we don't, you know, that, that we don't have any control over and that um, it's very easy to bake things like surveillance in. And the idea around a lot of the software that we're starting to use is that is that, is that these companies are giving away services that are free as in charge so that they can collect user, a user base. And then there's the, 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 the actual term for the, this in, in the business model is that it's a pivot business model. It's collect as many users, collect as many people to sign up as possible, and then once you have that critical mass, pivot away to something else that can make more money. And free and open source software, it's a business model that is, is much tougher to pivot away from social good. And so, um, we have a bootstrapping problem in free and open source software right now, um, and we always, we always have, which is that often free software lags behind. It takes us time to catch up, and people want to have convenience. They want to be able to Skype. It's very difficult for me to tell my in-laws, for example, that they can't Skype with their granddaughter. You know, I'm like the worst. I'm the worst daughter-in-law, right? I'm like denying them, you know, my 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 child, their their granddaughter, and you know, as many times as I say, well, let me install Jitsi, let me, you know, that for them, it's like you're just making it difficult, you're making it hard, and 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 that means that our user base is smaller, which means that it take us it takes us even longer to catch up, and so it may seem sometimes like free software is so much more difficult to use, and that it's not worth the effort, but I would say. Do not estimate your power <laughs> as consumers and as developers. So, um, so how many people here are not developers but, uh, but are users of software? Like a lot of people, yeah, right. And I think a lot of um, talks at, at, at these kinds of conferences are focused on developers. Um, but I think actually users have a tremendous amount of power. Because so do you guys remember the whole DRM thing when Apple had DRM on all of their songs in the iTunes store? And customers started saying, what? I bought my music and you want me to buy it again? Like, that doesn't make any sense. And they started getting a lot of pressure from the consuming public. And they changed their model. Consumers have a tremendous amount of power. You have a choice. And those choices that you make about the software you use makes a tremendous amount of difference. And you know, explaining why I might choose to forgo. So, Admittedly, I am on the really extreme sense that, side of it. Ever since I, uh, I, I got that like pale and um, incredibly nervous feeling when I realized about how bad the software in my heart could be, I, I got really radical and I stopped using as much free as much um, I stopped using as much proprietary software as I possibly could. So I do things like I run Replicant on my phone, and that means that I can't use my GPS in my phone. <laughs> so sometimes I'm wandering around asking people for directions on the street. <laughs> and they're like, don't you have a phone? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I don't, it, it, it's worth it to me for the inconvenience, even though it means that I sometimes have to explain why I'd rather not do it. It's worth it for the inconvenience because I know that if we could get a little bit more momentum about this, it would have a tremendous amount of effect, of effect on the free and open source software alternatives. And it would be, um, you know, it would, it would do a lot to help push us to the next, um, to the next level of, um, of being able to compete at, just on a, a product merit alone. A lot of free and open source software is used for core technologies and then there's the secret sauce on top. But if the consuming public said, actually, this isn't, you know, this isn't what we want, companies would start to realize that actually software isn't where their business model really is, right? Our business model is on getting new features when they're, you know, we want, we want the newest, we want the greatest, we want things that are, um, you know, we want things that address our problems now. We want support. We want the things that are easy to use. We don't necessarily care about copyright licensing on software. And by, um, and by realizing that we actually have a tremendous amount of power as consumers, um, it, it, I, I think we could really make a change. So here are the stats on implanted uh, devices. Um, so there are three million people like me. That's a lot of people. Three million people like me that have pacemakers. Um, every year, 600,000 are implanted. Actually, it might, it's probably more than three million now because this stat is a teeny bit old. Um, and 20 million Americans have some kind of implanted medical device. I mean, that's a, that's a lot of people. Uh, and the way I see it is that if we're lucky, 
we're all going to be cyborgs, right? So I'm unusual in that I have a heart condition, right? I'm unusual in that I'm, you know, I'm a relatively young woman <laughs> with a, you know, with a, a pacemaker defibrillator. But over time, we're going to find out that there are a lot more people. It was, it was an accident I found out about my medical condition. We're going to have cheaper diagnostic tools. We're going to find out that a lot of people are walking around with my heart condition. Uh, right now, the only people who find out are people who accidentally find out like me or people who have suddenly died or gone into sudden death and been resuscitated. If you hear of um, kids that have like run to second base and, uh, and drop dead or young, you know, young people who run in marathons and suddenly die unexpectedly, they often have my heart condition. And we're going to find that it's much more prevalent, I believe, than we think that it is. And as these devices get cheaper, anyone who might have a risk will be able to have one and it won't be such a big deal. You know, as we develop with medical technology, we'll find that we're integrating all of these things more. Into, okay, then also people told me, you know, that, that people have criticized this kind of thing and said, uh, well, actually, um, if you use language, you're a cyborg, and if you wear glasses, you're a cyborg. And so, so it's pretty, like, loose. We can all probably say that we're cyborgs. Um, but the ways that we integrate technology into our bodies and into our lives is only going to get more integral. And, um, and I think that's a really good thing. And I think that um, that if we're, if we're lucky, we will all have to worry um, about software in our bodies uh, because we'll have such an, improved, uh, such an improved way of life because of it. And so because of that, we all have to insist on ethical technology for our future cyborg selves. So I wanted to keep this a little bit short so that, um, so that we could have some Q&A time. I, uh, I think we have like 10 minutes for questions. And then um, I'm actually going to admit that I, I have to run to the airport. So if we run out of time, uh, if anyone wants to give me a lift, they can ask me as many questions as they want. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, the Conservancy is a, um, is a charity, so uh, please uh, feel free to donate. And um, so, okay, so let's, let's open up to questions. Who has questions? Yes. Is your daughter a cyborg? Is my daughter a cyborg? She is not yet a cyborg. Um, she, we're, we're lucky enough that so far she, my, I have a two-year-old daughter, um, and she's adorable, and she'll be an adorable cyborg someday. Um, uh, but, uh, but actually there's a lot of genetic testing that you can do, um, and we haven't done it yet. My, my, um, my condition doesn't actually manifest until someone is at least 10 years old, so there's kind of no point in finding out now if she's, uh, if she's going to need this. But, uh, oh, she does use language, so <laughs> she is a cyborg, yeah. I have a question on a completely unrelated topic. I am tutoring women to get involved in the computer business. I'm teaching them software development and software tests. And I look around the room and we're a bunch of white guys. And I want to know if you have any advice you can give me on how to get more women involved in yeah, that's a really complex question. And um, for those of you who might not know, I co-organize a program called the Outreach Program for Women, which is um, organized to help bring women to free and open source software. Raise your hand if you've participated in this program as a mentor, as a participant, as, yeah, thank you, as an organizer, a, a good amount of people here, um, and thank you. So, so, so the program, of, the Outreach Program for Women was organized um, and designed, and one of the things that we had, we really wanted to do something pragmatic, because the reason why if you start and sit and think about the reasons why we're not including women in technology and in free and open source software are complex and it's hard to know which of the, like every time you come up with, it, with one solution, others are suggested and it's very hard to know what it is. So we basically have tried to find to overcome obstacles for each one of the reasons why we think without trying to figure out which one it is. Um, so we could have like a whole other talk on the reasons why girls are not coming into technology. But I would say one thing, um, which is, when you guys are in meetings or if you are participating in communities, pay attention to the women in your community and just pay attention to the conversations because women are much more likely to get interrupted. Um, I can't tell you how many times that I have participated in a meeting, and it's not just in technology, but it's especially in technology, where I came up with an idea or I suggested something and nobody reacted to it. Nobody reacted to it. And then, like, five minutes later, two minutes later, some guy suggested the same thing. And all of a sudden, it was like, oh, what a great idea Jim had. This happens all the time, right, all the time. How many people, so there aren't that many women here, but how many women here have had this happen to them? 
right? All of them, almost. Um, yeah, not everyone, and that's great. Like, you know, it's glad that, and the other thing is like, how many of those, how many women here have noticed that they get interrupted a little bit more than their male counterparts? Yeah, that happens a lot. So I ask of all of you, just pay attention in meetings if you see women getting interrupted. Like, it's just, there are studies that actually they have done that have shown that, uh, that, women, that, that women get interrupted significantly more than men do. So they basically monitored conversations and they were able to determine that this is actually a phenomenon that we have, it's, it's across disciplines. And so, um, so pay attention. Women, women often get overlooked for their contributions. So if you see a good contribution from a woman, just amplify it. We call this, in, there's a geek, in geek feminism, there's a term that's called magic man sparkles. <laughs> that's actually what they call it. And it's basically, yeah, it's that if you could, as a woman, you, can, you could suggest something until you're blue in the face. But if a guy says it, then suddenly everybody's like, hey, what a great idea. You know, like, so, so if you're a guy, just pay attention and amplify what women are saying. You, know, you don't have to, to make a big deal out of it, but just by, by if you're using social media, you know, uh, you know retweeting or, or, or drawing attention to those microblogs um, or, or other um, posts is, is really, really valuable. There's another study, and I'm sorry because this is sort of a little off topic, but there's one other study that I read that was kind of interesting, which is that as early as 20 months old, parents are talking to, the, to boys about math concepts and are teaching them um, teaching them about these basic things about technology and they're not doing it with girls. And it's, it's both fathers and mothers. And there was one study that was fascinating where, um, where they had uh, girls and boys go through an obstacle course or go through a, do a little problem solving thing. And what they found was that parents of girls tended to help them a lot more. They, you know, that there's this instinct that we have for little girls to help them with things. Um, and, and, and which means that we're preventing them from learning problem solving skills in the way that we are allowing boys to. And these things are very subconscious. So what they did is they changed the study so that they told parents that they couldn't interfere. Like, so they just told them you have to wait until the child finishes on their own. And what they found that even then, when the parents were standing at basically what was the finish line, as soon as the girls came into reach, the parents would reach down and pick them up out of the, out of the obstacle course. And the parents of boys would let them run through the finish line and to them, and they would pick them up. And so girls weren't even having that experience of finishing. And this is really like deep, uh, deep-seated psychology. So, um, so I would say just bear in mind that girls are being told subtly from a very early age that these kinds of skills are not valuable, that it's not for them, they're being frustrated from, from early. So there are a lot of things that we can do, and um, I'm happy to talk about as many of them. I recommend that everybody read like Geek Feminism, uh, the Geek Feminism Wiki, and get involved in the outreach program for women. So, um, one of the problems that Always talk about when you're building um, open source medical devices is that um, nobody wants to fund open source medical devices. You're never going to be able to get it through you. Uh, you know, all of the FDA classes. Do you have any advice for helping those projects get further? And also, would you be going to mentor teams about working on that? Yeah, I would love to get involved in different, in different initiatives. I, I really would. I mean, the, the issues are pretty complex, and I found that, um, that uh, so the reason why I started talking about my own medical condition, because first when I published my paper called Killed by Code about these issues, I didn't say anything about my personal situation, and I started posting it on pacemaker forums and like for patients. It's a sort of like the, the very places that I was getting support as a lurker, and, and said, hey, you guys might want to check out this paper, and I got attacked basically saying, you don't know what it's like for your life to rely on this piece of equipment. And you don't, you don't know what it's like, and you're just trying to scare us. And I realized that, you know, like I was like, yes, I do. I really know. <laughs> but I didn't want to have to be the I didn't want to have to talk publicly about the fact that I was somehow had a problem, you know. And so I've kind of, I've kind of owned that. But in that whole process, I realized that actually patients are not really the ones that are making the decisions on this. Weirdly, patients are not the customers. It's actually the cardiologists that are the customers. They're the ones that are choosing the medical devices. The medical device manufacturers, one over the other, and they're the ones asking the questions that the medical device companies are scrambling to answer. So I've started trying to um, expand my education to cardiologists because, and, and to doctors, because I think that they're, the, they're actually the consuming public that could move. And so it's probably, I mean, medical devices are the perfect example of where, um, of where there's no real business model for keeping things closed and proprietary, right? Like nobody chooses is Medtronic because of their software. 
right? People choose medical device manufacturers over one another because they have better support, because doctors feel more comfortable with, the track, you know, with their, their, um, their track record, that it's precision manufacturing. Like if somebody published the, um, the specs for the defibrillator, even if a company like Nokia decided to manufacture them, it would take a very long time for them to prove that they have the track record that would get cardiologists to move. So, so really, it's, it's a really interesting space, and I think that, um, that it, it, as soon as we can overcome this misconception that security through obscurity actually works, I think we'll have a, a, a lot of traction. And it's very difficult to, um, to get doctors to see it, but, once, but they're technical people. Once they see it, they, they understand. Once, once you see, you can't unsee. So, so, so doctors tend to get very upset. And so I'm sort of focusing in that area. And, um, you know, and I, I think that there's a lot of great work in um, medical devices with uh, free and open um, hardware and software. And we're basically only going to get there through successes. So, yeah. So this is specifically about <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah. So I'm Car what? My name yeah. is Karen Sandler. S A N D L E R. And it's very easy to find the paper I wrote. Killed by code is uh, is on the Software Freedom uh, Law Center website, which is softwarefreedom.org. If you look under publications, you'll see the paper. It's a little old now, but it it holds up. It's still the same. Okay. So my mother. So every time I go in to get my, my pacemaker defibrillator read, I go into the doctor's office, they have a little machine. And if you have a wireless one, it automatically starts to register. For me, I have this thing called, they call it a programmer. And they just sit, sits on top. It's it, it, like you feel the magnet engaging, and it's like, chunk. it's really weird. And then you feel like you're like, you know, seven of nine stepping into the thing. But, <laughs> but, but, but like, you know, and it's weird because you feel it like in your, you know, in your body that it, it lines up. Um, and then they basically have a, um, a, a, a machine where they, they take off the information, and it tells you about the, um, the battery levels. And what I've found is that technicians really vary in their skill. There's a movement by, um, there's another guy who has, who's also um, comparably aged. He's just a couple of years older than me who has the same heart condition that I have and also a pacemaker defibrillator. His name is Hugo Campos, and we didn't even know about each other. We both have been giving very similar talks, but he focuses on open data. And so we're basically two sides of the same coin. And so for him, he's, he, you know, he, he's sort of pointing out to the fact that you know, we need access to the data off of our devices so that we can do our own analysis. Because what I've found is that the tech is that the technicians widely vary in their skills. And so one technician will tell me that I'm gonna need my pacemaker replaced in, in the next few months. And then I'll go see my regular uh, technician and she'll tell me, oh, you've got at least another year, or probably more. So, you know, it's, it, really, it really depends, but if we get access to our data, and this is where these issues around ethical technology and these issues around our control of the technology in our lives makes a huge difference. We, we have to finish, okay. I, I, I wish I could stick around, but as I said, the offer stands to, uh, to have a, a, an audience. <laughs> Let's give Karen a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you.